And with us this morning to review the newspapers are broadcasters and journalists Thomas Copeland and Badisha Mamata. Good to see you both again. Uh, Badisha, let's kick off uh, with the article you pulled out from the Daily Star. Interesting, isn't it, that this warning from the National Trust today that, you know, extreme weather is going to become the new norm has even been picked up in the Star today. Quite strong lines. Yes, it has. And it follows on from your lovely interview with Ben McCarthy from the National Trust, who every year do a survey of uh, how the year has gone in terms of nature and wither nature and what's happening with it. Unsurprisingly, the news has not been very good for the last few years. But they're pointing out that the seemingly headline grabbing climate manifestations we've had in the last 12 months are indeed going to become the new normal. So the wet bits are dry, the dry bits are wet, the solid bits are collapsing, the bits that should be liquid are solidifying. And the survey is interesting because it reminds us of the kind of year that we've had in 2022. If you cast your mind back to January, we had a very warm and mild January. And then in February, we had flash floods and heavy rainfall. And then a crazy heat wave summer where we topped 40 degrees for the first time ever. And then the snow snap just before Christmas and now an oddly mild Christmas. And Ben McCarthy and the rest of the National Trust have pointed out all the, the micro consequences for the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And of course, uh, the climate emergency isn't just picking out National Trust properties. Unfortunately, it doesn't discriminate at all. So they're pointing out that exactly as he said, we need to engage global world governments in coming together to fight rising temperatures because as dramatic as it might be and as interesting as it is to read it on the headlines, it is not good for the planet to live through. Yeah, absolutely. Even though those tropical rainstorms and flash floods that we saw in the summer and, of course, mild months in the winter, as you say, we, we see such uh, so regularly now, uh, don't we? Um, to you, Thomas, the I, page eight, you pulled out the story that the North East may be the next area to get its own elected mayor. That's right. The government's announcing a £1.4 billion plan for devolution northeast of England. The headline, I suppose, is a directly elected mayor. First elections May 2024. This is one of these proposals that has great potential and, and devolution deals have been championed by Labour and the Conservatives over the last number of years, often kind of put forward as a bit of a silver bullet to every imaginable problem. A, a note of caution, I think, always against devolution for devolution's sake, coming from a place like where I am at the moment in Northern Ireland, where devolution is very dysfunctional. It, the devil's in the detail and you need to look at what are the specific powers, responsibilities and autonomy that these devolved uh, jurisdictions have. And by the look of this article, um, they don't appear to be very expansive at all. It lists adult education, budget control, local skills improvement plans, some money for local rail services, some money for housing and regeneration. All of that just leads to a situation where devolution and devolution settlements can become a bit of a talking shop, an extra layer of bureaucracy, a nice extra layer of jobs for politicians. The big thing that's always missing from devolution, I think, across the UK is really critical revenue raising power. That's the thing that adds in accountability. That's the thing that adds in responsibility means that politicians can't always point to central governments when they need more money, which invariably they always want and, and ask for, and actually give them some responsibility for raising it as well. So, you know, this is one of a problem that you see, I think, in devolution across the entirety of the UK. If we want to do devolution right, we need to buy into it. We need to give proper powers um, and responsibilities. This halfway house system doesn't really work. So we'll see in 2024 and onwards as more of these deals start to come through how effective they are. But that, that would be my major concern. OK, interesting stuff, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Badisha, The Guardian, interesting story you pulled out. Former Spice Girl Mel C has cancelled her New Year's Eve performance in Poland. Why is that? I'm smiling because Mel C is my fave, but this is actually a very, very uh, serious story. Mel C, Melanie Chisholm of the Spice Girls, had been set to do a New Year's Eve performance for Polish state TV. She's now pulled out of it, saying that matters have been brought to her attention because of certain issues, which she doesn't clarify, which she says don't quite align with her values and her beliefs. Reading between the lines, her fans have said that this is, in fact, because of the Polish state, uh, the government's uh, attitude towards uh, LGBT rights. Uh, it's not illegal to be gay in Poland, but there is no recognition of same-sex marriage or civil unions, and it is not legal 
for same-sex couples to adopt if they want to start a family and have kids. They are not allowed to do that. And in fact, Poland ranks very low on the EU list of what it's like to be gay, uh, have gay rights and to not be discriminated against in daily life, in work, in life, in family, in terms of values. However, Polish state TV has fought back. And one of the journalists from, from this broadcaster has now tweeted out a video of Mel C uh, performing for Russia in 2018 uh, with a slightly snarky note saying, uh, well, you know, perhaps Russia aligns with your values. And there's been a statement put out saying that, in fact, Mel C has had to cave into online comments. So it's a very interesting story about stated values, uh, a state's stated values. So, of course, this doesn't mean that you have to boycott your Polish friends who are very pro-LGBTQ plus rights, but it's about what does the government represent. And this whole argument around cancellation and should it be, could it be that a major artist is having to live in fear of what's going to be said in terms of their optics, or should they just be allowed to get on with it and sort of be a pop star without being touched by socio-political issues. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And of course, uh, sports personalities uh, suffered uh, the same uh, issues in Qatar recently with the World Cup. Nevertheless, girl power from Mel C there. Uh, let's end on something a bit lighter, shall we, Thomas? Uh, this lovely article that you pulled out from The Times, a 74-year-old retired teacher who failed his 11 plus has just graduated from university. Tell us more. I love stories like this. They pop up occasionally. So this is a 74-year-old man from Swansea. His name's John Wilshire. He's graduated with a master's degree in environmental dynamics and climate change at Swansea University at the age of 74. Failed as 11 plus, managed to get back on his feet. He, he trained as a teacher, then did a while study, while, while uh, working as a teacher, did a, a, a degree at the Open University, three diplomas. Uh, there's a great line where he says his last exam was in 1987. And he said, quote, surprisingly, some things have changed since then. <laughs> Thomas Badisha, that is a lovely story. Thanks so much uh, for ending on that. We'll see you again next hour. Thanks very much. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we'll have all the latest on that uh, shocking stabbing in Birmingham on Boxing Day. Family and friends pay tribute to 23-year-old Cody Fisher, who's been named as the victim of that attack in a Birmingham nightclub. We will be live in Birmingham at the top of the hour with the latest on this story uh, of that attack on Boxing Day, of course, following that other shooting, uh, that shocking attack in, in Merseyside on Christmas Eve. We'll have the latest on both.